program on advertising law and practice. We're very fortunate indeed to have two eminently qualified chairs. We have Mr. John Foss on my immediate left, who is president of the Association of Canadian Advertisers Incorporated. And I'm told because I have to be educated, obviously, which is why you're, you people are here today, you want to be educated too. But I am told that this association over many years has taken a very active role in the development of legislation in the area of advertising. Our co-chair is Mr. Wayne McCracken, who is a lawyer who has been practicing for a goodly number of years in the areas of antitrust, competition, advertising, and marketing law. And he has been employed with the Combines Investigation Antitrust Branch, the Department of Justice in Canada in the summertime. He articled with the firm of Campbell, Godfrey & Lutis, as it then was known, and he has returned to that uh, law firm uh, in Toronto after his call to the bar in 1969, and he was a competition law partner with the firm until 82 when he decided to go out on his own, and currently he is a sole practitioner, uh, concentrating his practice, as I mentioned, in antitrust, competition, marketing, and advertising law. He's an author of a numer numerous articles, and he has been a lecturer on numerous other occasions. And I'm going to turn the chair over to them. And on behalf of the Law Society, I welcome you here today. And on behalf of you, I'd like to thank our chairman for taking on this task and thank all of our speakers today for what I know will be a very informative presentation. I don't know which gentleman, Mr. Foss, to start first. Thank you, Brenda. It's a particular pleasure uh, to uh, welcome you to the joint ACA Law Society of Upper Canada seminar dealing with the intriguing and risky subject of advertising law and practice. It's a program des uh, designed for lawyers, for advertisers, for advertising agencies and uh, we will review with you the uh, legal rules that apply to advertising generally and explore the legal management of advertising in relation to legislation and the regulations that apply. We will even take a look at the anticipated developments, uh, a kind of distant early warning system and in the first part of the seminar, the emphasis will be on the legal side of advertising activities. And in a minute, Mr. Wayne McCracken will provide an introduction to the law of advertising. In the second half of the day, we will hear from three separate panels, each including advertising practitioners and lawyers. And here we will examine the, that uh, those developments that may change and in some cases add to our current legislation. We will examine the self-regulatory system at work and uh, we will have a look at the legal management of advertising from both the perspective of the advertiser and the legal community. But now, to provide the introduction to the law of advertising, here's Wayne McCracken. Thank you very much, John. Today, John and I have gathered together a number of leading voices and experts in the area of law and from the advertising profession. John and I felt that the topic was particularly one which we hoped and expect can integrate both disciplines. Certainly as somebody who practices in this area, uh, to as great an extent as in any area of law I've ever, ever uh, dealt with, it's critical to interact with the client in relation to the client's objectives and motives uh, as opposed to simply dealing with what I would consider to be relatively stale or, or uh, conventional legal issues. Uh, I hope 
especially in the panels this afternoon, to get uh, at the symbiotic relationship involving advertisers, agencies, and legal counsel, both in-house and outside. It was about four weeks ago that I was sitting having co coffee uh, uh, in the offices of the Bureau of Competition Policy here in Toronto, and a very prominent member of the advertising profession uh, came up to me and we exchanged pleasantries, at which point uh, the, tie, the, the fact of this uh, session arose and this gentleman expressed uh, the following view, who cares about advertising law anyway? I found that a rather challenging question. It was, it was explained somewhat by this, this gentleman. Uh, he noted that the most recent issue of the Misleading Advertising Bulletin, put out by Klaus Decker's Marketing Practices Branch, uh, had only noted something in the order of eight or so, uh, or a small number in any event, of, uh, of cases brought to fruition within the prior three months. He also noted uh, that the companies, organizations involved in those cases were fly-by-nighters and the fines were minuscule. And the concluding comment was, it's all a bunch of flurry about nothing. Now, I'm putting this out not, not to start on a downer, nor to try to justify the kind of session we have today, but it stimulates me to make, a, make just a few comments. Uh, first of all, anybody who has been involved in a, in a case, uh, in a real case, involving advertising law issues, I don't mean just review, but I'm, I'm thinking, for example, litigation knows that there's a lot of pain and suffering and a hell of a lot of expense involved if uh, one's client runs afoul of the advertising laws, speaking generally, or, or Competition Act provisions in particular. I guess that's one response to this, this uh, fellow. Another uh, arises under uh, the Supreme Court decisions in the Roswa construction and in the city national leasing cases. Supreme Court of Canada, as doubtless many of you know, held that Section 36 of the Competition Act uh, is constitutional. What that means then is that finally we have an answer that individuals can sue for contraventions of, among other things, the advertising provisions or representation provisions of the Competition Act. Now for anybody who might be non somewhat nonchalant uh, about the penal consequences fines and potential imprisonment arising upon a breach of the Competition Act representation provisions, uh, that same person might take some pause uh, if he or she recognizes that today consumers and competitors have the clear right to sue for and, if they establish them, recover very substantial damages uh, in the case of a breach of the competition law provisions, and, and just, just in that note, since uh, those decisions, I, I am now involved in three actions which have been launched uh, using Section 36 as a basis uh, in the case of misleading representations or allegedly misleading representations. So therefore, it, I think the topic we're discussing today is, is important to lawyers. Um, it certainly is important to agencies and it's important to clients. As I note in my paper, which is published with the materials you received, in Canada we have an, an abundance, and some might say an overabundance, of laws, regulation affecting advertising. John Foss's organization, Association of Canadian Advertisers, has been involved for years in the development and in the refining of that legislation, and continues to be. The laws exist at all three levels of government, federal, provincial, municipal. When we look at federal legislation, just to name a few, we have the very important representation provisions of the Competition Act. We have several provisions of the criminal code, lottery section, counterfeiting section, trading stamp section, which affect particular kinds of promotions. 
particular approaches to advertising. Food and Drugs Act, Catherine Gurley will be speaking very knowledgeably on its impact on advertising. Consumer Packaging and Labeling Act, Textile Labeling Act, Broadcast Act, Copyright, Trademark, a whole bunch of legislation that must be borne in mind by, for example, a legal practitioner in considering any promotional activity, marketing thrusts and advertising that, uh, that his or her client might bring, to, uh, bring for legal advice. As we again know, the provinces, particularly in the 1970s, got involved in business practices type legislation, which deals with consumer representations and truth in advertising in relation to consumer representations. The advertising of credit has long uh, been subject to provincial law in relation to disclosures. Three provinces, Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, and Quebec have statutes which have the effect of, of deeming that any claim or promise made in an advertisement, any representation made in an advertisement is a warranty. All provinces regulate in some manner or another the advertising of alcoholic beverages and securities. The province of Quebec has a distinct kind of approach. The Consumer Protection Act of Quebec is an omnibus statute which deals with matters covered in Provincial Business Practices Acts, Truth in Advertising, but has a number of provisions which go well beyond. Uh, an absolute prohibition of advertising directed at children under 13, a virtually absolute prohibition, a requirement that in the advertising of premiums, equal emphasis must be given to products being advertised, goods and services. Quebec is alone in venturing into uh, the regulation of promotional contests, imposing a tax and requiring rather extensive uh, pre-publicity disclosures in the case of, of a contest. And of course, at the municipal area level, rather, we have uh, signage laws which uh, regulate outdoor advertising. And uh, as one client of mine discovered to its great chagrin and expense uh, 15 years ago, uh, closing out type bylaws which which regulate uh, and require licensing in relation to bankruptcy and, and supposed closing out sales. One can't ignore the common law. It imposes important limits on certain aspects of advertising. Laws of libel, in particular trade libel, impact upon, uh, upon comparison advertising campaigns. Law of passing off has application. Contract law obviously applies to define rights and obligations, uh, in some cases between people uh, viewing advertising or reading advertising and the advertiser. Common law rules have been developed to lay down certain guidelines for fairness in relation to contests, particularly the administration of skill testing questions. In recent years, a new concept has arisen which lawyers must be aware of, appropriation of personality. Uh, this, this common law puts limits on the commercial exploitation without compensation of uh, the likeness and, and voice and so on of, of in particular celebrities. I should just note that uh, the provinces of British Columbia, Manitoba, Newfoundland and Saskatchewan have statutory provisions which for many years have prohibited uh, the use of, of uh, name or portrait of an individual without compensation in advertising. In some, then, advertising generally and particular kinds of advertising and particular approaches to advertising, such as contests and the use of coupons, are surrounded and governed by a plethora of laws, statutory and common. And through the speakers today, we hope to be exploring, and in particular, through your questions, exploring uh, to some depth uh, the substance and the impact and how to deal with these laws. The Competition Act contains what I consider to be the cornerstone provisions in law affecting advertising. It's a federal law, the prohibitions are criminal in nature. A number of people who work for the Competition Bureau who are here today will be pleased to 
know that I consider that those provisions are vigorously and fairly enforced. In considering any advertising, you have to keep in mind that whatever other considerations legally one might have, it's always important to ask whether or not there might be a breach of a provision of the Competition Act, representation provisions. Now, Ollie McCaig and Klaus Decker, uh, after I conclude my remarks, will be starting to consider in depth uh, the prohibitions of the Act, so I don't intend to say anything more at this time. I said the laws affect particular kinds of promotions. Contests are certainly on the list, if not at the top of the list. The lottery provision of the criminal code uh, has two impacts on contests as a promotional device. In order for a contest, commercial contest, not to be prohibited, there must be the exercise of a reasonable degree of skill on the part of the person who ultimately is declared the winner. And hence the ubiquitous skill testing, and not, the not quite ubiquitous skill testing question. And also if money forms the whole or an important part of a prize, uh, generally no purchase can be required. That is, that it derives from the chain letter provision of the uh, lottery section. The Competition Act applies to contests which otherwise are lawful, that is to say which otherwise comply with the criminal law or lottery provisions of the code, requires disclosures, adequate and, plain, uh, adequate and fair disclosure of the number or approximate value of prizes, uh, of any fact which to the knowledge of the advertiser materially affects the chances of winning. If Quebec residents are eligible to enter a contest, as I said earlier, tax must be paid and there are rather extensive filings to be made at least 30 days before the contest uh, commences by way of publicity of the contest. A common promotional device or advertising device which is potentially impacted by the criminal code is the use of coupons. Certainly some coupons <coughs> may be trading stamps and therefore any lawyer who is consulted on a promotion which involves or may involve coupons would be well advised to consider whether or not uh, the client uh, may be running afoul of the, uh, of the trading stamp provisions. Something which in my practice has, has come up uh, rarely, but when it comes up it's a mess, is the use of paper money in, uh, in an advertisement. Uh, once you fight your way through the uh, counterfeiting provision of the code, at least I have come to the conclusion that you just can't use paper money in, uh, in an ad. A matter we're going to be discussing in the last panel today is uh, the timeliness uh, observed by clients in seeking legal advice in relation to advertising campaigns. This paper money thing may seem minor to, to you, but it certainly is a classic example how early advice from a lawyer uh, can avoid a heck of a lot of expense and suffering. If the promotional concept involves, importantly, the use of paper money in an advertisement, um, a competent lawyer consulted early will simply say it's a non-starter. Much better at that point than after $150,000 worth of television production is in the can. The Competition Act affects the use of testimonials in advertising. If one's going to use a testimonial, Section 53 of the Act requires that the person giving the testimonial give written consent. Comparison advertising is fraught with potential legal problems. In that regard, I should note that in my experience, most governmental authorities look very askance at comparison advertising. The authorities' uh, skepticism arises from the fact that rarely will a product, and when I use the word product, I mean good, or, good and or service, rarely will, be a, will a product be significantly superior to a competitive product in all important respects. Because of that, it is natural that an advertiser will seize upon the important respects in which his or her product is superior while playing down or almost invariably totally ignoring 
the aspects in which the competitor's product is superior. That then, of course, leads to the natural conclusion that there may be deception in a comparison advertising campaign. Comparison pricing in advertising is fraught with particular problems. Uh, if one's going to, well, I should say, the, the case books, case reports are, are replete with examples uh, in which uh, comparison pricing, <coughs> savings claims, specials, sale claims uh, have been prosecuted and convicted. In particular, where no saving existed, or a, a no claim saving existed, or or was exaggerated. The Competition Act, paragraph 52.1d, specifies that if one uh, talks about the price at which a product has been, is being, or will be sold in the future, uh, that price is deemed to be the price generally prevailing in the market in which the adver advertisement appears. Um, unless it's specified particularly in the advertisement to be the advertiser's own price. This is a comparison price advertising provision. The courts have also considered the use, which is again so tempting for advertisers, of suggested prices in comparison price claims. Suggested $199.95, our price, or our sale price, or sale $99.95. Rarely will a suggested price or list price be the generally prevailing market price of the product in the market area, rarely. And therefore, um, uh, Mr. Decker's uh, Bureau has given, I think, fair warning a number of years ago to advertisers to beware of using suggested or list prices unless they're satisfied the suggested or list price is the normally prevailing market price. Before I conclude my comments, I'd just like to address something which I think is near and dear to people's hearts when they get involved in one of these cases, in particular when, when uh, they as consumers or they as competitors feel that they are being jobbed by an advertisement. What can I or what can we do? Well, first, one can make a complaint to the authorities. One can persuade the appropriate authorities that there's a breach of the statute. Normally an investigation will proceed and uh, if uh, felt warranted prosecution and a possible conviction will result. Secondly, and I already adverted to Section 36 of the Competition Act, in appropriate circumstances one can sue for damages. The problems with both of these uh, approaches they are not mutually exclusive. One can sue and one can complain. Uh, the, one doesn't have to pick one or the other. The problems with both, of course, is that uh, they involve the court process. And uh, therefore, there are delays. I normally, again, in my experience, acting for an advertiser or the advertiser's agency that feels wronged by a competitor's advertisement, uh, the objective is not to recover damages. The objective is not to throw the president of Pierogi Inc. in jail. The objective is to stop the damn campaign. How do we do that? and stop, not in the sense of four years from now, but stop as soon as possible. Uh, later on today, a panel will be discussing the Advertising Standards Council, and that's certainly a complaint to the ASC. Um, uh, I'm talking about a valid complaint. Uh, can result in effect the boycotting of, by the media of an advertisement, and that can be a very timely and effective way to, to achieve that objective. Now, I've just now I guess in a somewhat scattergun approach, uh, given uh, the highlights of the kinds of laws in the, the area and the specifics of some uh, that apply to advertising, my message is there are a whole lot of legal issues involved really in most advertising campaigns I've had anything to do with. It's a complex field and uh, uh, if there's any doubt, uh, you know, that you get competent legal advice. Simple as that. Now the first formal speaker today is Ollie McCaig. On the program, you'll see the name Don Affleck. Uh, Don is a partner of Ollie's, and Don, uh, unfortunately, has two clients that, it, as we talk, are being, uh, I think the euphemism is searched by the Bureau of Competition Policy, uh, and uh, Don simply had no option but to be at 
at those clients. And I gather Ollie, he's bifurcating himself to, to, to deal with two, or two with one with one rate. Um, in any event, he just couldn't be here today. He expresses through me his apologies, but he is very ably uh, pinch hit for by Ollie McCaig. Ollie is senior counsel with Faskin Campbell Godfrey. Ollie, for many, many years, was uh, uh, general counsel for Shell. Uh, I had the, the privilege of working with Ollie at Campbell Godfrey, as it then was, for two years after he joined the firm before I left. And Ollie has as extensive experience as anybody in this country with advertising law matters and is as well qualified as anybody uh, I could think of to speak to them. Ollie? Thank you. I think it would be um, a little misleading if you were to open your book uh, to the informative, well-written paper that's presented by a member of my firm because I won't be dealing with it. It's uh, perhaps a good place to start is to remind ourselves that we are in the sector of criminal law when we're talking about a federal prohibition of certain types of advertising. And that uh, is because of a constitutional anomaly that the Constitution Act of Canada confers on the federal parliament rather limited powers uh, if interfering in trade and commerce. It, it must do so only under the uh, sector of trade and commerce that's interprovincial or national in scope. And in the field of criminal law, as has been pointed out many times by the House of Lords, it has to be dealing with what is a real crime, not something that's just a shame. As with the House of Lords pointed out in Parsons, a label doesn't make criminal that which is merely scandalous. In misleading advertising, we begin with the concept that what's the advertising about? It's a commercial. This law that we're going to look at, and it would be very helpful if you turned up one of the appendices to Wayne McCracken's paper, and uh, looking at sector A1-3, where we're, we're given the text of section 52 of the Competition Act. The advertising that we're concerned with is commercial, which in the parliamentary draftsman's language is, it's language that is for the purpose of promoting the supply or use of a product or for the purpose of promoting, directly or indirectly, a business interest. A lawyer's advertising is caught because we are engaged in the business of supplying a product. A product in the Competition Act is defined in eco economist terms as including both an article and a service. So we are, in this part of my uh, remarks this morning, looking only at commercials. In other words, it's perfectly proper to lie socially, to lie politically, uh, to lie matrimonially, but it isn't proper in the criminal sense to lie to extract money from a person. Now, talking of crime, you think, why isn't all this in the criminal code? Well, the answer is that it was misleading advertising up to 1970 was simply a, a crime in the criminal code. But the criminal code under the sharing of authorities, rights and duties between Ottawa and the provinces, criminal code's theirs. The criminal code is enforced by the provincial police. And the provincial police, it was perceived in the days when Ralph Nader brought consumerism to an awareness that it never had experienced before, was not being enforced. And there was no avenue for private prosecution. There was no way that a citizen who felt that he'd been stuck with a real lemon could enforce his rights out. He couldn't afford a lawsuit. He couldn't go to the police. He couldn't go uh, anywhere except to perhaps a, um, a church and pray for remedies from someone beyond the can of the cops. So it was decided there were a growing bureaucracy 
located in Ottawa with very little that the public could perceive was being done for them and the idea of consumerism in Ottawa grew and we had for the first time a department of consumer affairs tagged on to corporate consumer and corporate not corporate and consumer and that staff were given a law taken out of the criminal code and put in the then Combines Investigation Act and a, an army of people suddenly grew with the enth enthusiasm for enforcing naturism. Now that we've got our, our laws in place, let's look at what exactly is it that we're talking about. Well, if you follow the text, now that we've got through the first four lines of that great line, we're t we are um, looking at uh, and the offense of making a representation to the public that is false or misleading in, in material respect. So we, the uh, prosecutor and, and the defense counsel, have to look for the second and third elements of the offense. First it was commercial, then it's false or misleading, and we'll take a look at that, and it is in the material respect. Let's get rid of the materiality first. If we're looking at a commercial that someone has paid for, he's paying for every word. You, the counsel, may caution him to take out a certain word that you find objectionable, but he's paying a thousand dollars a maggot inch. If every line, every word in that commercial is material to the client, to the advertiser, to the agency. And it's material to the reader if it influences the reader, and if it doesn't influence the reader, then it isn't material, but who's going to pay for it? And I caution you that if you hang your defense on the materiality, or rather the immateriality, of the allegation that you're facing, it's going to be an uphill fight all the way. So let's come and look at, now, are we really doing something that's false or misleading? Well, the commercial has a purpose. Do commercials lie? Let's put it this way. Is there deception in the commercial? Well, deception in, in the old days, and there's a beautiful example of it in Klaus Stecker's paper, and don't skip to it yet, hold your horses. In the old days, people lied, and now they don't lie anymore. But do we lie? Of course not, it's against the, our ethics. Do we engage in the distribution, dissemination of falsehoods? Well, no, but Think again, what are we looking at in the text of camera advertisements in today's Globe and Mail? Two bro bold, broad spreads. Maybe there's a lot of truth there, but is it what we euphemistically call the half-truth? Is there concealment of the other half? Put it this way, is there an ambiguity in that advertisement for a camera at 50% off. Well, there we are, and that's very clear what's wrong and what's right. But this law that we're considering is, is, um, introduces the concept of misleading impression. Now, that, this is a very difficult legal concept to explain to a client, and I use a test. There's a, a poster. What did you get from it at first glance? And if the first glance is, is she or isn't she, and you go back for a second glance, I claim that the first glance may have been misleading, but the second glance was warranted, so therefore, I think we can assume that copy will receive a second glance. And what I've just said took a great deal of courage because careful solicitors prefer to be cautious to tone down the advertisement so that it's cold and calculating dull. That's why my advertising clients, like my Irish Fleur, I give them a chance with my second glance test. Now, let's look at the general impression with your second glance. I, is it or is it not misleading? 
And here's where you look at your audience. Well, I have seen the courts in recent months. Take a look at who is the audience. Very interesting case in involving a company called International Travel brought up the point that its advertisement wasn't aimed at the illiterate, the credulous, the unthinking, the great unwashed. It, this particular vacation was aimed at people with leisure and money, and the court added, oh yeah, that's right, and they must have had a fair level of education to get that money. So they would have read the fine print at the bottom of the advertisement, which cautioned that this particular seat sale had conditions and limitations, restrictions of dates and number of seats. The level of the intellect of the consumer is a dangerous one to play with. If your client, if your corporation is aiming at a particular audience and is advertising in a technical ma magazine, I think it's fairly safe. Now, I don't think that I consider that the Ontario Reports is a technical magazine read only by lawyers. Before any of us can get to it, our secretaries have gone through it and read all the divorce stuff that you, other readers other than lawyers. But we do have this concept of at least looking at your audience and beware of the specter of the credulous man. Well, everyone thinks that Imperial Tobacco in that famous Alberta case where they were indiscreet enough to put in an advertisement that there was $5 in every uh, cigarette package gave us the credulous man. Now that isn't so. Those of you who are lawyers uh, would remember the wonderful old 1893 case of Carlisle and the Carbolic Smoke Ball. Now you actually came across it in learning the law of contract. What's an offer and what's acceptance? But this is what the courts actually said about the Carbolic Smoke Ball Company. You have said no one would take us seriously. It would, it's only a mere puff that we say we'd a hundred pounds on deposit for anyone who contracted influenza after using our smoke ball. But the court said the real answer to that argument is that if a person chooses to make extravagant promises of that kind because it pays him to do so, and the, the extravagance of the promise is no reason in law why he shouldn't be bound by it. And here I come to the credulous woman. Such advertisements do not appeal so much to the wise and thoughtful as to the credulous and weak portions of our community, way back a hundred years ago virtually. Now, I was going down the scale from the real black deception into the misleading impression, and now we're going down a little further in laws concepts, and we come to what's unfair? What are you doing in your advertisement that's unfair? Now, here we're getting a little bit away from what's truly a crime, and you really got to ask yourself, if somebody from Ottawa, be it from the under the guise of the Food and Drugs Act or the Broadcasting Act or the misleading advertising sector that Klaus was heads up. What is the authority of that person to challenge me on the unfairness or otherwise of my genuine, from the heart message for the con out there to the consumers? What's unfair about it? Well, it has to be an, either under the, the authority of criminal law, it's so unfair that it's, it's wrong, it's a crime, or it has to be under the guise of health and welfare, another federal jurisdiction, or it has to be under the guise of control of broadcasting, and now we're beginning to see challenges under the charter, under the, the label is, are you interfering with my freedom of commercial speech? And we're going to see more and more challenges to the non-criminal control and management of advertising. We've, many of our courts have said that the, the federal government 
has absolutely no authority to engage in the minute of regulating trade. The great rebel Bud Esty said in the light beer case, you can't regulate a single industry. You can't regulate the manufacturer of beer to tell him what goes on his can. So when you're dealing with the bureaucrats, begin with the position of righteousness. Where's your act? Where's your jurisdiction? Where's your entitlement to rewrite my copy? Now, in this area of the, the area of unfairness, we, we are in one of questionable jurisdiction. But we have, in, in this section that we're considering, consumer protection that's absolutely black and white. I think it is, it is well founded in constitutional law as a federal matter. Are you making a representation to the public in the form of a statement or warranty that's not based on an adequate and proper test? I think that's good constitutional federal regulation. The unsubstantiated test, what your client is doing is making a claim to the public that no member of the public has the means, technology, or other capacity to test. So the government, the legislator, is putting the burden on the advertiser of making sure that if a claim is of, of uh, performance or durability is made, that indeed there has been an adequate and proper test conducted prior to the disclosure of these wonderful pr products capabilities to the public. Now, moving a little further down the, the line of uh, towards the end of the tunnel, and we're starting off with absolute black and again we came to gray and now we're coming to something that's virtually white. White is ethics. What, what is your advertiser doing out there? Is he creating a, a perception in the minds of the consumer that this product is new and different, different. We're seeing a great deal of artificial product differentiation. We're seeing claims that, I'll pick a good one that we all love, that one cigarette is less damaging than another. They're all damaging, I understand. I don't smoke cigarettes, I smoke a hefty pipe. What, is your client really being ethical with the product, with, with the claims that he's making for it? And here's where we have the first conflict in the writing of advertisements. <coughs> I don't think it is at all a good system that one person who has pressure on him or her to get the, a market sector increased for a product should alone be accountable for what is said to the public about the product. This is where we need a breathing space, a second opinion. I'm not promoting that the second opinion is necessarily that of Fask and Campbell Godfrey. The second opinion should be someone in the organization who at least in space and time and accountability is removed from the writing of the advertisement. Far too often I've seen the, the author being mesmerized by his own perception and it only takes a, a person who's got other interests promoting a different product to point out that there's a non-warranted exaggeration, there's a non-substantiated claim, perhaps there is a lack of a test. Look, I come to, in, into this sector and we see the, the emerging now of provincial jurisdiction. The province doesn't have the constitutional capacity of deciding what's a crime. What the province is entitled to do is enact laws that are for the protection of the consumer. They're, they are entitled to deal with civil rights. If you have taken out a, a, a car loan and have been misled as to the cost of credit and suddenly find you're compounded beyond your means, that's, a ma that's an affair for the province. And the province is entitled to get into protection of consumers against misleading advertising. And the province is entitled to say something is misleading for the purposes of protecting the consumer, whereas 
in the federal sector, I repeat, it wouldn't be misleading unless it is material and it's false and it's a general impression it's really a lie wrapped in sugar coating. So when you turn to the uh, consumer protection laws, which you, which you don't need to do right now because I'm not going to read them, they're in a different frame. There are sanctions for the disobedience of those laws, but just because you pay a fine doesn't mean that it's a crime. Crime is reserved to the federal parliament. Please be careful when your client comes up with the claim that this is a brand new product. Uh, th there is a case referred to in, in uh, the uh, paper that uh, comes under the title of Don Affleck, but he didn't write it, where, where somebody put more water in his beer and claimed it was new beer. Now that, that's stretching credibility, but we far too often are, are given uh, the uh, signal, please approve this, it genu genuinely is a new and improved product. It's, it's a, an eye catcher. It isn't new and improved if it's something immaterial. Uh, green beer is not new and it's not improved, but it sprouts all over the province of Ontario on the 17th of March. Beware of, of the use of uh, free. Freeze in today's Globe and Mail again. There's a tiny asterisk beside an enormous balloon, tiny asterisk and a tiny footnote with the purchase of this mountain bicycle. Well, whoever approved that advertisement had to take a, a calculated risk. I would have approved it if it was a good client of mine. But after advising him that there may be other uh, lawyers, good, well-educated, conscientious members of the public who think this isn't really a free crash helmet as the case was. What we have is, is really the practice of law dealing on the razor's edge, and I can't quantify it, but I do like the, the guy who comes to me and says, well, what are the chances? Who's going to prosecute me? I'm just a little bicycle manufacturer. And remember, I didn't act for him. I wasn't asked about that advertisement. I can't answer that question. I say to him, look, I'll tell you if you're driving to Montreal, what the speed limit is on 401. But if you want to know how fast to go, don't ask a lawyer, ask a truck driver. I'm going to be around with Klaus for questions later. Thank you. what might be the ultimate irony of today struck me as you were early in your remarks and that is leaving John Foss aside the first two speakers are Irish obviously or Irish by descent and uh, I wonder if uh, the topic today might have any relationship to Blarney I, I certainly hope not I said it that's correct I take full full responsibility our next speaker is Klaus Decker. Klaus is Deputy Director of Investigation and Research in charge of the Marketing Practices Branch, Bureau of Competition Policy. I think we all should be honored that Klaus has agreed to come from Ottawa today and address us. He, after all, is the man who, subject to the director, is responsible for the administration of what I repeat, I consider to be the cornerstone legal provisions affecting and controlling advertising in Canada found in the Competition Act. Klaus has experience since 1966 in the administration of these laws within the Combines Investigation Branch and uh, when its name was changed, Bureau of Competition Policy. I've had dealings with Klaus for many, many years, and I uh, uh, would simply like to turn the platform over to, to Mr. Decker, and once again welcome him to, to Toronto, and on behalf of the Law Society to this program. Klaus?
Thank you very much, Wayne. And both the chairman of the sessions here today, thank you very much for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to come because I'm a great believer in dialogue. Uh, and I'm a great believer in doing everything that we can in preventing offenses from occurring in the first place. That's why we have a compliance program. That's why we have a uh, program of uh, advisory opinions. First, though, a couple of comments. Uh, I was all set to apologize um, on behalf of the director for the uh, uh, matters which prevented uh, uh, Don Affleck to be here today. But I'm sure that Don will forgive me if uh, I rather take some credit for the events which brought uh, Ollie McCaig here <laughs> today. Uh, I think his uh, uh, remarks are very uh, well taken. And um, I have only a couple of minor uh, um, additions uh, or questions in this regard. Uh, first of all, uh, while he was correct in saying in 1970, 1969, uh, 31st of July, to be precise, the transfer of the then Section 306, the broad prohibition against misleading advertising, was uh, 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 brought into the then Combines Investigation Act for, indeed, as Ali pointed out, more vigorous enforcement. Uh, however, that was not, and I'm quite sure that the consumerism and Ralph Nader and the, the, the sentiments of the day had a great deal uh, to do with the transfer of that section and, uh, and uh, I'm full agreement with what he says. Uh, however, uh, I, I want to point out that the very first section, and uh, the paper uh, talks about this, uh, dealing with misleading advertising, the section that Wayne referred to earlier, the, the, the uh, section as the regular uh, misrepresentation of the regular price uh, was brought in to the Combines Investigation Act back in 1960, and that was done at the behest not of consumers. There was no consumerism, if you will, uh, uh, really in existence, or no organized consumerism. It was done at the behest of business people, of retailers, who came and wanted to have some protection against the unfair competitive practice of exaggerating the ordinary price or the regular price of the product. And that was the origin and maintains today as, or we maintain today, uh, uh, is the basis for these provisions being in competition legislation rather than in consumer protection legislation per se. And I'll be talking about that for uh, a moment. Um, the second point that I wanted to respond to what Ollie was saying was uh, uh, I wish we had been able to create an army of bureaucrats to help us. Uh, if you see the people on the second row on this side of the table, that basically constitutes the Toronto office uh, uh, that is uh, responsible for the administration of these, uh, these laws. We, we have uh, grown admittedly in the heyday of, uh, of expansion of public agencies uh, in the early 70s. Uh, at that time, I might remind you, there was no one else in the business. The Department of Consumer and Corporate Affairs was uh, created in the late 60s and uh, through a transfer of a number of, of uh, uh, agencies that dealt with the what we call today the operation of the marketplace, both on the corporate and, as Wayne pointed out, on the consumer side. Uh, but many of these agencies, of course, had been in existence before in other departments, trade and commerce, uh, we were with justice, and so on. Uh, however, uh, while there was some growth, the growth uh, that we saw uh, as an organization in the government charged with the responsibility for, for enforcing uh, certain laws, was, in my view, not commensurate with, the, with what we call the demand for services. Right now, we uh, receive about 13,000 uh, plus complaints per year in which someone in the country makes an allegation of misleading advertising. I'm not suggesting they're all valid, uh, but we have to respond to all of them. 
and the, the, the administrative burden to just respond and assess these complaints in itself is, uh, is uh, a fair bit uh, uh, of work to do. And to do that, we have uh, in the upcoming fiscal year next week 69 people uh, to do it, and that includes the support staff, and that's across the whole country. It's not uh, uh, what you would call uh, a major uh, bureaucratic machinery. Uh, however, we do the best we can, and I'll come to that in a moment, too. Uh, I wanted to, before br taking you briefly through the paper, just make one more comment that responds to something that Ollie said, and this is the credulous man doctrine. Uh, um, uh, lawyers and, and, and companies weren't the only ones, uh, advertisers weren't the only ones who uh, were a little nervous uh, when the uh, imperial oil decision came down in the early 70s, creating the credulous man doctrine. And I, I won't go back to the carbolic uh, stuff there, but uh, we have a similar little ad as you referred to in our paper. Um, however, we were a little nervous when that decision came down because we hadn't wanted to take the, place, uh, take the case in the first place. But that was sort of in the rising heyday of uh, let's show the public what we can do and we had Ron Basford as a minister at the time, and he was pushing very hard for us to look into the case, and we said, well, fine, we'll take the look into the facts, and we looked into the facts, and we brought the facts before the Department of Justice, and boy, the Attorney General was hot to trot, and they laid the charges, and we thought the court's going to throw this out. I mean, there's no way uh, that uh, people will take, uh, you know, that the court would take this seriously that in a, in a package of cigarettes, which, which then cost uh, about a dollar or so, uh, you would find five bucks, and that was indeed, as Wayne said, the 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 or all he said was the representation. Find five dollars in every pack. What they meant, of course, was find the chance of winning five dollars in a pack. And once you open this, of course, you got the got the rules of the game, and you participate in the game, and so on. However, the courts said no. The public, particularly uh, when buying this kind of a product, as opposed to the executive jet, perhaps, or uh, uh, the 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 skepticism one. Uh, one feels when one reads the, the Ontario reports, no doubt uh, was such that uh, the courts felt the credulous uh, man or person uh, doctrine should um, apply to that kind of stuff and they were convicted. Uh, what you may not know about this case was that a couple of students in Alberta, this was a test market situation in Alberta, where you entered this game and this was a scratch off thing if memory serves correctly, a couple of students got into this game and broke the code. And they bought these damn cigarettes by the truckload, opened each package, th threw away the cigarettes, and took the company by winning, breaking, you know, putting in winning entries again and again and again, took the company for another something like $30,000. Uh, uh, that'll teach you. Now, um, uh, as as you know from your, from your books, we, we have a paper entitled The Perspective of the Marketing Practices Branch. And uh, I don't know who writes this stuff for Don Affleck. Uh, I was in the habit for years and years to write my own stuff. Uh, this year we have in the person of Chris Martin a new officer, a lawyer I might add, who is, uh, as you can tell, very uh, uh, articulate uh, and uh, has a knack for writing, so I've asked him to put this together, and I felt we might better give Chris some credit. Even though he can't be here today, he is in England vacationing, and that's not too bad a place to be, uh, to be this time of uh, the year. However, what we say in there is, uh, is sort of uh, our collective branch knowledge that we've been talking about for many years. Uh, I'm not going to uh, take you in detail through the whole paper, uh, I, I assume all of you uh, are pretty good readers. Uh, you wouldn't be in this profession if you weren't. Um, and I let the little example of the not quite carbolic uh, uh, smoke bomb or whatever it was that Oliver was talking about, but some other little ad going back to 1914 speak for itself. Uh, at the end of the paper, I think there's an order form. I don't know whether they still take the orders. Uh, however, uh, I want to highlight just a few things because I think it's, it's, it's uh, uh, better to say something about something than to say 
everything about nothing. And in consequence, I'll be brief uh, in this presentation and leave um, uh, for questions later the, the, the more meaningful dialogue that I'm sure that you will want to engage in. Because there are a lot of questions in this, and that's why these sessions are so useful. Uh, I think it was, uh, <coughs> was Wayne who referred to the symbiotic relationship that we all have, uh, you and serving your clients and the people from the business community in uh, being involved in product advertising. On the govern government side, we are being involved in looking into these matters in a regulatory or, or um, uh, investigative way. And I think we are all, uh, in that sense, part of a family. And the more we can share our common knowledge and experiences, and the more we can interact with one another in the prevention of offenses from occurring, I think the better off we are. Um, and in consequence, I think it's, it's um, better to, uh, to, or if you want to look forward uh, in, in, in planning for the future, of course, you've got to take from time to time a uh, step back and look in, into the past. And as far as um, the, the paper is concerned, it talks, uh, it basically has three um, areas. It talks uh, initially about the history of the legislation. And those of you who may have been at the uh, centenary of the, of the uh, um, Bureau of Competition Policy last fall uh, in uh, the Sutton Place uh, should know that, that while misleading advertising does not quite go back uh, to 1889, but the first law indeed, as Ollie mentioned, in the criminal code was put into the criminal code in, back in 1914, and we have uh, uh, therefore sort of um, an anniversary of sorts with uh, over 75 years. And uh, I think it's quite clear from the um, quotes, and I won't, won't take you through them directly, uh, at least not the old one, but the, the second one. Uh, on, uh, on page three of the paper uh, by the then Justice Minister, uh, was it Ed Colton? I forget his first name, I think it was Ed. Dave, David. Davy Fulton, yes. Uh, uh, explains, I think, to some extent the rationale that we put today on the association with competition policy uh, and what we up to recently uh, uh, used to call more uh, effectively by its American term antitrust uh, uh, policy and that refers again to the to the to the request by the retailers for some pr uh, protection uh, um, back in 1960 uh, and the the uh, quote further down by John Turner, who was uh, also the first Minister of Consumer and Corporate Affairs, um, this quote here in his uh, capacity as Attorney General at the time, uh, I think bespeaks the fact that the consumerism of the 60s had something to do with the transfer of the um, uh, section, which by that time had been renamed uh, or renumbered from 406 down to 306 into the uh, uh, Combines Investigation Act as uh, Section 33D, I believe it was. This is now the broad prohibition against misleading advertising that we're talking about when we're talking about 521A. There were some further uh, legislative um, amendments in 1976 which did not alter the scope of the legislation uh, or, or of the provisions of the legislation uh, in any way, but specified more specifically the, the, the particular uh, practices uh, as guidance to advertisers and to provide uh, for the enforcement agency ourselves a little better handle on the particular practices. Uh, we are now talking about not only representation to the public that are false or misleading in material respect, we're talking about performance claims, we're talking about uh, bait and switch advertising that in itself may perhaps be a little misnomer. You find it on the margin of the act itself. And I have, by the way, I have to apologize for the sad state of affair of the office consolidation of the act. We have ourselves not received a reprint, so everybody who requests might get a very poor copy of a very poor copy in the first place. So please bear with us. We're, we're, we're trying to do the best we can. Governments at all levels are broke these days. 
The, uh, these amendments then talk about uh, or, or more specify the contest advertising and the permit and referral selling and the sale above advertised price. And when it comes to the bait and switch selling, it's really a section that says, to be specific, it's an offense to advertise a product at a, at a bargain price uh, that the advertiser does not have reasonable quantities in stock in order to uh, satisfy the, the uh, uh, expected demand. And of course, that reasonableness uh, relates to the product itself and the, and the, 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 the size uh, of the advertisement and so on and, and so forth. Um, what the, the um, Act did in 1976, as you may recall, some of you certainly uh, uh, have in fact been involved in, the, in, in, in create, creating some of these um, uh, amendments, uh, it brought in at that time the services sector as uh, a sector of the industry being subject to the Act uh, in, in full up to that time services had been specifically excluded because the Act spoke only of, of, of uh, articles. Now a product, as we speak about in the Act, is defined as both uh, uh, an article and a service. Further amendments in 86, which concluded the, the two-stage upgrading of the um, competition policy, if you will, did not materially affect the misleading advertising provisions because they had been dealt with in the first stage in 1976. But I think it's noteworthy um, that uh, uh, Crown corporations that are in uh, competition with the private sector are now specifically included in the purview of the Act, and that's, I think, a very, very important step. We had, up to then, uh, had a couple of um, uh, prosecutions against Air Canada, but Air Canada, by its own statute, was specifically exempted from being an agent of the Act for the purposes of, uh, of um, uh, statutes such as this one. Now, uh, when we talk about the administration of the section and the policy objectives, uh, I'm always a little uh, at a loss because usually when I come onto the podium such as this, there have been a couple of eminent speakers who have touched upon uh, most of the bases that I wanted to cover. There's very, very little uh, 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 to say, and particularly uh, Ali's very eloquent uh, uh, sort of walk through uh, some of the arrays on debt and uh, and his comments indeed are very well taken. We uh, feel very strongly in the uh, in the bureau and as is exemplified in the purpose section of the act that uh, we want to serve the, the public interest in creating a marketplace in which purchasers be they consumers or anyone else along the chain of distribution can make more, uh, better informed, and, and we like to think, therefore more rational purchasing decisions. And those decisions can only be made on the basis of full and accurate information. And where that is missing, then, uh, or where confusion exists and uh, puffery uh, gets into the play, then deception is usually not very far behind. And in consequence, we, we feel that, that the, the specific inclusion of the reference at the end of Section 1.1 of the Act uh, of 1986 now, uh, which says, in order to provide consumers with competitive prices and product choices, uh, clearly embraces this without even mentioning the word advertising, because uh, 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 the, the, the objective of the Act, as we see it from the inside, is not to regulate advertising, but to create uh, um, a functioning, uh, well-operating uh, market information system, and uh, you will you will hear Bob Galloway later talking about his views on 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 how he sees advertising to to um, uh, you know having a very legitimate role uh, in the functioning of the economy, and we have no quarrel with this, and our uh, uh, I think work with the. ACA and the Advertising Standards Council and other groups have, I think, over the years um, uh, made it quite clear. It's for that reason that in administering or in enforcing, I don't really like the word enforcing, it has sort of the wrong connotation. 
in administering the provisions of the Act, we have, uh, even before the current compliance-oriented approach of the Director of Investigation and Research with respect of the administration of the Act as a whole, we in the Marketing Practice Branch have for years taken an approach that was directed towards achieving, with the limited resources that we have, the most effective and, and, and highest degree of, of compliance, and we have placed great emphasis on uh, the information and education flow, if you will, the, 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 the dialogue and the provision of um, um, advisory opinions to advertisers as to their future promotions. And uh, uh, in consequence, um, we, we feel what we're doing now is, is not a departure from previous practice, but only a logical extension. And we feel, and I want to talk about this uh, in a minute, uh, the, the reform proposals that we are now uh, are working on are again only a logical extension to make the thing work better and more effectively, uh, again for the benefit of, uh, of the public. Uh, I won't uh, take you in detail through the various steps, our information, um, and education efforts such as a dialogue here, but our frequent um, talks at all levels of the organization to business associations or individual firms who bring together their uh, sales managers, for example, to, to raise the level of awareness should all help towards eliminating or at least minimizing the uh, occurrence of, um, of, of offenses. Our, our program of advisory opinions, again, we, we uh, have done this for many, many years, and those of you who read the Misleading Advertising Bulletin um, uh, will be aware of this. We started some years ago to, in a generic way, uh, print some of these uh, opinions uh, as in, in the bulletin uh, in order to provide perhaps better guidance to advertisers in this area, and it's been very well received. Uh, we should keep in mind in all this that we do so because uh, of the origins of the Act and <coughs> the fact that we have in the past relied on the criminal law and the fact that the Director has no regulatory authority. We, we, we want to make the system work through this uh, compliance-oriented approach, and I think it has been working. For many, uh, uh, many years ago, we have uh, uh, invented, so to speak, what we call the information visit or contact, we call it now because we do it both in person and in writing, whereby our investigators uh, may go to an advertiser and say, look, uh, we've got this complaint. We don't really know whether it's valid. At this point, we don't have sufficient information, and we do not intend to pursue it because it doesn't, on first blush, appear to be very high on uh, uh, any reasonable uh, priority uh, ladder. However, unless we tell you, uh, Mr. Advertiser, about it, uh, you can't take any action uh, which may or may not, in fact, be required, but we want you to know about it, and that's the end of it. And uh, we have uh, in excess of a thousand of such visits uh, uh, or contacts each year in which we bring um, to the attention of an advertiser a potential uh, complaint, not disclosing the name of the complainant, just the situation, <coughs> and leave it up to the advertiser. Then the advertiser can take such action as uh, as uh, he uh, uh, may wish, if indeed there is uh, uh, a problem. And if there wasn't, well, that's the end of that. The only hammer, if you will, we have is that if down the road we get continued complaints about the same practice, uh, we know we've warned the guy and he doesn't quite have the same uh, uh, ability to say, who me? I didn't know about this or something like this. I wasn't aware. He was aware. When it comes to inquiries under the Act, of course, we are uh, fulfilling a statutory duty. The Act uh, provides that the director, when he has uh, reasonable grounds to believe that an offense has been or is about to be committed, must initiate an inquiry. Uh, now, the Act also provides that he may refer to the Attorney General uh, such inquiries that, in his view, uh, uh, warrant that step, and in the past it has usually been with a re recommendation for uh, a prosecution. 
Now, the Act also provides that the director must discontinue an inquiry with a report to the minister and all these, you can see the bureaucratic convolutions that come into play here in Wayne uh, uh, in the old days when he was a student in the bureau. You know, that's what the student does. First of all, they start writing discontinuances. And I tell you, discontinuance is sometimes more difficult to write than a summary of evidence in which at least you have something positive to say, saying this guy did it and you've got to throw him in the slammer. But when you want to rationalize the fact that you, you damn well know there was an offense but you don't have the evidence, then it gets a little more, more difficult. And so we try to avoid having to do this. And for this reason, we don't initiate an inquiry, uh, or you should not think that every time an investigator goes to one of your clients that we are conducting an, an inquiry. We call this an examination. The way the system works is we get a complaint or some other information. We don't rely on complaints, but they're pretty good at 13,000 complaints. And a, an increasing number, I might add, from competitors still a fairly small percentage, but increasing because competitors, I think, are today, and the business people among you will perhaps uh, be aware of this, that competitors today are a little more prepared to come forward and, and say, I've had it, you see, because competitors begin to realize that the detrimental effect of many of the practices that are prohibited in the Act aren't so much against consumers. They're against the honest competitor down the street. And we now have people, I'm telling you, coming with video presentations to support their complaint. I wish sometimes they did this with uh, the support of documentation for their claims, but that's another matter. In any event, uh, after an initial assessment of this information, uh, and mindful of the fact that we are not in the consumer protection business, and in consequence are not acting on behalf of individual uh, consumers should be aware of this. We're always using the information as, ba as a basic mail bank, but we are not in the redress business. That's, as Wayne pointed out earlier, more a provincial matter. We then assign on a priority scale, given the fact that we have limited resources and not an army. Only, I wish I had an army, boy. Anyway, uh, the major cases, or the more important ones, you know, on the basis of fairly well-established criteria, and if you want to follow this up, we can do it later, uh, for an examination. And that's when the investigator goes out and makes the contact and verifies the fact, et cetera, et cetera. If that examination then provides what we call reason to believe, the matter then is raised to the level of an inquiry and, and, and assumes a statutory uh, nature, a statutory uh, uh, dimension, if you will. Now, as I said, in the past, most cases that were subsequently referred to the Attorney General, uh, and the ratio has been out of a couple of thousand such investigations, examinations, inquiries, uh, about a hundred, roughly, cases have been referred to the Attorney General. So uh, in the past when sometimes charges were made that, you know, we had a bunch of uh, uh, overly zealous bureaucrats who are trying to hammer everybody, I think these stats speak for themselves that there's a very fairly low level of cases that indeed go forward to the courts. Uh, in fact, in recent years, with uh, greater demand, dwindling resources, and our alternative case resolution we'll talk about in a moment, we, we have even reduced this, this year we will have no more than uh, about 80 prosecutions in total uh, in the fiscal year, uh, and we have a number of alternative case resolutions. Uh, and these are now in keeping with the director's, uh, what we call the compliance-oriented approach, and I should show you uh, the, uh, first the misleading advertising bulletin that was that was mentioned earlier is the is the the branches quarterly bulletin which we report and and Wayne was absolutely right when he points out that in the uh, in the number three issue of 1989 <coughs> we had six cases with a total of fifty thousand and five hundred dollars in fines this was an all-time low and and the only saving grace I think we have is that we are not trying to rack up maximum numbers and maximum fines we have never established targets if you will, for this kind of an output because uh, it would be akin 
to the quarters that uh, the Green Hornets have in giving X number of parking tickets in order to fulfill their quota. We have stayed away from this. We are trying in the new year to, uh, to, to reestablish individual quarters for our investigators in terms of we want you to finish so on so many uh, inquiries or investigations and that comprises the various m uh, types of outputs that should arise from this and they fall into the following categories uh, oh, sorry I, I forgot the 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 um, other bulletin that I wanted to draw specific attention to is the director's compliance bulletin which was uh, issued in June of last year and anyone having an interest in these or anyone who isn't on the mailing list please give me your card uh, sometime during the day and simply write, write on it MAB and I'll see that your name is placed on the mailing list. So far the government has not cottoned on to cost recovery in regard of these documents and uh, we will hope, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can keep it that way uh, for the foreseeable future. The government is supposed to go broke, let them go broke on something else. Uh, the the a disposition of our investigations, examinations, inquiries now falls into basically three categories and that's all spelled on the compliance bulletin and, and in another bulletin, a uh, misleading advertising bulletin is, uh, is detailed a little more in respect of the misleading advertising provisions. And basically we will continue to <coughs> refer the, the cases of uh, major impact to the courts for an appropriate adjudication. Cases that demonstrate mens rea in the first place and this being a strict liability statute, uh, it's sometimes difficult to assess this. Uh, or you don't have all, all the facts but, but, but where that seems to exist. Uh, for example, the scamsters. Uh, drag them to the courts and hammer them as hard as you can. On the other hand, uh, you have legitimate and reputable firms who inadvertently commit offenses under the Act because of the very uh, 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 fact that sometimes the line between what is acceptable, what is not acceptable is not quite, uh, quite uh, 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 clear. And so we are taking now uh, to making recommendations still to the Attorney General with a reference to the Attorney General to greater use of Section 34 sub 2 orders and there are uh, two, um, uh, well, Section 34 has two types of orders, prohibition orders under, under, under subsection 1 that can be and have in the past been added from time to time to the uh, uh, conviction, to a, a, a criminal prosecution or consent orders under 34 sub 2 in which in fact it is not necessary to admit the commission of an offense but only the commission of a practice directed toward the, 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 the commission of an offense. A fine distinction perhaps, but nevertheless legally a very uh, important distinction. And uh, in this way we are able, uh, we think, to address the problems in the marketplace perhaps more effectively than uh, through a um, an exclusive reliance on punishment of um, a convicted offender and the associated deterrent with this. And we go one step further and you see in upcoming issues of the bulletin more cases that will have been resolved at the inquiry stage through the acceptance by the director of uh, an undertaking that uh, uh, contains appropriate remedial steps to correct the situation and restore the balance. We are still not, and I, I, I want to repeat this, while such uh, corrective action may in certain cases involve the restitution uh, to individual parties uh, of, um, of improperly uh, obtained monies, uh, the, the, the aim is not uh, to obtain redress for individuals but the aim is to have such restitution be part of a restoration package to put the uh, uh, competitive situation back into equilibrium. Uh, and we are, we are 
fairly new in this. Uh, we are we're training ourselves in negotiation techniques uh, to be uh, uh, equally effective as our learned counterparts on the other side are uh, in these matters and hope to resolve more uh, uh, cases that do not have the elements of, uh, that would require prosecution. In this way, in order, of course, to do this and be able to defend the inevitable uh, criticism that bureaucrats are now taking the law into their own hands, uh, we have a carefully established, and this is why I pointed out the compliance bulletin, carefully established uh, criteria or factors for the assessment of appropriate cases, both in terms of the substance of, of the, 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 the deceptive, potentially deceptive practice itself, or the, the, the advertiser, the firm in question, and so on. Obviously, somebody who has received an advisory opinion on a particular matter which told him don't do that, and then he goes ahead and does it anyway, and then wants to come and resolve the matter by way of an undertaking after the fact, we would uh, 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 not be too enthusiastic of giving consideration to that. Uh, similarly, somebody who has been convicted half a dozen times of the same practice uh, doesn't stand much of a chance of giving fair consider uh, uh, of, of receiving uh, consideration by the director of this matter. So uh, we are uh, making uh, an added step in order to ensure fairness and equity uh, in the system, and that is we will make public every undertaking. Orders, of course, are a matter of public record, but every undertaking that the director uh, uh, accepts from an advertiser to resolve a particular matter in a non-prosecutorial way will be made subject of a uh, report in the bullet in the same way as any other case is reported, except that we will, of course, uh, attempt uh, to, as far as it's possible, to put a more positive accent on the reporting. In other words, they're not lumped in, first of all, with the convictions. You, you want to separate them physically, but you also want to give a different tenor to the resolution, and the tenor will be that we have cooperatively and constructively uh, worked together to resolve a problem in this way, and uh, we hope that that should work very well. As far as the future, while this, this um, compliance-oriented approach is uh, helping us, uh, at the moment we feel it is not sufficient. Uh, we're stretching, I think, the existing statute to its very limit and uh, uh, we have some difficulty in achieving the further efficiency gains that a, a government uh, in uh, some uh, degree of uh, financial distress wants us to make. And in consequence, we uh, have seized upon the uh, report by the Standing Committee on Consumer and Corporate Affairs of 1988, I think it was, to uh, pursue the quest for further amendments to the misleading advertising provisions of the Act. Uh, as some of you may be aware, calls for reforms in this area have been made since the, 19, uh, since the mid 70s, uh, basically for reasons that at the time uh, had, addition, had the additional uh, um, considerations of federal provincial sorting out where do we stand and greater uniformity having laws that are similar to the provincial laws although still remaining different in a, in a, in a, in a different sense. Well, we have sorted ourselves out with our provincial counterparts over the years, I think in practical terms very well. Uh, we have um, a good rapport with them. Uh, we don't fight, not even with Quebec. During the Haiti, I tell you, during the Haiti of the PQ government in, in, in Quebec, our staff in the Montreal office and their staff had an underground pipeline under which they managed against uh, the, uh, the, 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 the politicians' instructions to cross-refer complaints into the hands of the more appropriate agency and discuss matters of mutual concern because, you know, we're all in the long run in the same boat and, you know, we hope that our politicians can can find the same middle ground somewhere, but that's another story. Um, when uh, uh, the, 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 while the Competition Act was still moving forward and had not uh, 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 been 
uh, modernized uh, up to 1986, there was of course no chance in hell that we would be able to go forward and do anything at all. Uh, and for that reason, uh, the matter, we kept it on the back burner and didn't, you know, kept it alive, but didn't very much do very much about that. But when the parliamentary committee seized upon this subject, and don't ask me why we didn't suggest it, my understanding of the situation is that they had two choices. Uh, uh, to talk about corporate concentration, something that Ollie will more, uh, uh, is more familiar with than most of the members of the committee, and they shied away from this for, for obvious reasons. But everybody and his, uh, and his dog, of course, considers him or herself to be uh, an instant expert on misleading advertising. We, are, we all have a very strong conviction on this, but no matter which side of the fence we are on. And, and, and so the committee seized upon this and, and uh, produced a unanimous report uh, and, and published it in, in June of 1988. Uh, with 33 recommendations saying, yes, you got to do this, you got to do that. And many of the recommendations, of course, are those that had been made uh, 15 years before. Some of them, uh, well, at first they didn't know really what to do. And, you know, when myself and a few of people from the department uh, talked to them, they said, well, why don't you look into this area? It might be useful. And they thought, oh, this was great. And then they went down to Washington and talked to the FTC and so on and so forth. <coughs> they came out with this report. Now, they didn't have very many resources, and anybody who's read the report will know that their research uh, is not as, uh, has not been as profound as it was, uh, as it should have been. And basically, they put everybody's recommendations in there. It was a bit of a hodgepodge. Uh, after the election call in 1988, of course, any legal requirement for the department to respond to the report was null and void, uh, and consequently we could have simply let it drop, but we felt internally in the department was useful, I think, to, to maintain the momentum and, and see what we can do, but not in the comprehensive manner that the, department, uh, that, the, uh, that the report has brought forward, now generally known as the Collins Report, because Mary Collins was chairman of the, of the committee. We did some further studies within the branch and got informal uh, approval from the previous minister to uh, go ahead with this and, 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 and do some study, but no um, concurrence with, with, with uh, uh, going forward to, to indeed seek uh, uh, legislative amendments, and that is still outstanding. We are in the process of now going before the minister with basically uh, proposals in four areas that we have uh, studied extensively and over the um, course of last summer discussed uh, in a consultative fashion with um, all our constituencies, and that's primarily the business sector, uh, John's organization, and, uh, and most of the uh, um, business organizations, the consumer organizations, uh, uh, Wayne and, 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 and Shelley and a number of others who are, whom we call practitioners in the field. We have, uh, have consulted with them and said, now this is what we are planning to do and this is where we think we should concentrate on and what, is your, what are your views. And we had a fairly good response, including our provincial counterparts. And they just had a meeting, of course, here last week uh, um, or earlier this week indeed, at which uh, uh, they discussed some of this, Howard Weston the Director of Investigation and Research now uh, gave a speech to all the provincial deputy ministers and uh, there was a fair bit of interest and uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, the responses we had from the, uh, from the uh, provinces were, were very positive um, and uh, very encouraging um, because I think they recognize what we're trying to do is not, as I said earlier, change the substantive law uh, or make offenses that uh, um, today are not offenses, but simply get a more flexible toolkit to deal with, with what's there. And what we have in mind is looking into uh, non-criminal adjudications in addition to retaining the criminal law for the scamsters and the more uh, blatant um, abuses. And with the non-criminal adjudication, the appropriate remedial orders for a court to issue such orders so that they can be uh, more enforceable uh, as opposed to uh, the provisions in an undertaking today, which are a very informal uh, uh, and non-enforceable kind of stuff. Mind you, under the current situation, 
somebody provides an undertaking and doesn't follow it would not be well served in the future, of course, that, uh, that's for sure. Uh, a little bit of uh, contentious, more contentious um, uh, uh, issue is the question of, um, of uh, interpretive rulemaking, which we thought is useful to pursue because of the uncertainty in some areas of the law. But again, we do not want to uh, empower the director with that regulatory or quasi-regulatory authority to, to, to uh, make these rules, but we would only go uh, through order and counsel as another safeguard with appropriate input from uh, uh, our constituencies. And finally, we want to statutorize, if you will, the, the what we now call undertakings into uh, a more statutorily funded um, assurance of voluntary compliance. And again, we've received fairly good uh, response from all our constituents on that one as, uh, as an appropriate way. What we do not want, and uh, again, I, I must stress this, is to, to change the laws, but make them work more effectively uh, because much of, and it's already been said, and I'm sure it will be restated again for the day, what's going on in advertising is not, in fact, uh, the kind of practice that ought to be uh, labeled with a criminal tag. And that, in turn, is in keeping with the current, and I think with, with government efforts, not just the current governments, to decriminalize and deregulate and get away from, from a lot of this. And with that, I think I will, I will, I will stop for now and uh, leave it to the questions that will come, I think, after coffee. Am I over my time? I apologize, Mr. Chairman. Sorry, you're getting restless there. I guess one of the chairman's prerogatives is to decide whether coffee break will be deferred or not. And I made a decision to defer it for five minutes. Uh, I'd like to know uh, if there are any questions. Please address them to me. A fast skim of the room indicates no. So again, as chairman, I'm going to put one. <coughs> I've had two speeding tickets in my life. Each time I was about 10 kilometers or so over the limit and there were a lot of fellows going a lot faster than I was and the cops picked on me. And that's a fact. I also have clients who hear from me that advertising 50% off uh, when the basis of the off, of course, is a suggested price, in my view, uh, constitutes a probable breach of Section 52 of the Act. And I also have uh, statements provided by the marketing practices branch that indicates uh, that uh, if the base price from which the alleged 50% saving is not the normal selling price and so on, that that uh, would give uh, the branch reason to, or the director reason to believe an offense had been committed. Yet I hear about shortage of resources. I see ads in the newspaper, and I, what I see doesn't matter. My clients come to me and say we're being killed. Now, this is not coming every day, but it clearly is a problem. What I'm really talking about is the diversion, the law, or apparent law, or certainly the stated policy and a combination of law, case law, and policy on the one hand, and what we see in the newspapers on the other. Um, Klaus, do you have any comments on this kind of this kind of situation? This is not the first time you've heard this, of course. I uh, could I, having taken a minute and a half to pose a question, I asked you to respond in thirty seconds. Would you please? You had to bring this up, eh? Yes. Uh, this is a real and. Uh, I can see our people here uh, uh, all nod. It's a real problem with us because when you look, as Wayne said, into the papers today, you see it everywhere. When you see, look into a store paper, a store window, everybody has 50% off. And we've been wrestling with this. In fact, the law 
was fairly clear and we uh, administered it in the late 60s, early 70s, I think quite successfully with the regular price claim and I think, quote, cleaned up the market fairly well. Then everybody and his dog got into euphemisms uh, off and off this and off an unspecified sum and, uh, and used value and used all kinds of terminology to say the same thing. That is correct. But when people then started making references to the manufacturer's suggested list price and again using the general impression test, uh, while not so stating, giving the impression that of course consumers were getting bargains off the actual selling prices, we became more worried and we put out the director's position in that article that, that Wayne had referred to earlier saying where you use this kind of terminology, MSL 100 bucks, the day special 20 bucks, without saying anything else, we think there are reason to believe that an offense has been committed and we, we, we said so because we made a study on the subject of a consumer research study which showed that the majority of the people who were the subject of that uh, uh, survey had indeed so perceived that message. And the courts have made it clear over the years that the, that the meaning of words and phrases should not be that ascribed to a particular industry or a bunch of experts, but John Q. Public. Uh, having said that, uh, the resource question is indeed a major one. We have taken a few cases to court and have been successful, except in all of those cases, the cruncher was not the price comparison, but the savings claim. And the savings claim, of course, you can take on the 521A and its predecessor. And that's what they were usually convicted on, first and foremost. Uh, so we, we addressed some of the problem, but not the whole problem. And then with the, with the um, recession of the early 80s and ongoing from there on in, this kind of advertising has become, uh, uh, I think, much more, on, you know, various comparisons, price comparison has become much more prevalent everywhere. Uh, it was worst, and you'll read it in an upcoming issue of the board, and it was worst of all in uh, the window blinds industry, for example. And uh, two, three years ago, we consequently said, what are we going to do? We can't chase after everybody. It's like everybody's speeding. The cops catch you, and dozens of people can you know, go you. by. Only you. Well, you know, you're not the only one. We know. Anyway, we undertook an initiative. We wrote to everybody in the industry, a whole country, and said, look, the law says this. We think this. We think you're in violation. And you may be hammered in the near future. However, we came clean. We said, look, we can't be everywhere. So, if you want to make any changes within a reasonable time frame, fine. We'd be happy. We had follow-up seminars. Some of you may have attended, uh, you know, as concert, some of these seminars across the country in different cities. And I think we were able to get, in a voluntary compliance way, a great deal of improvement into the situation. However, the drawback in this situation is, as an enforcement agency, we must be prepared to answer the question that your client come up, why me? And if I am now going to put myself into compliance, how about the guy down the street who doesn't? Can he get away with this? Now, again, this is where we have a problem with the criminal law approach, which is too lengthy, too cumbersome. We said we ourselves will put as much priority onto follow-up uh, um, investigations and referrals to justice for prosecution and pushing justice to go as quickly as we can in those cases where people do not uh, comply. And, and we have done this. And now I think we have, we must have had in the last 18 months or so about 15 or so prosecutions in the window blind industry of those who did not comply or initially did and then fell off the wagon again, this sort of thing. So we're doing this. We're talking to a couple of other industries right now uh, in a compliance oriented uh, way trying to get them to do something. And I've just written a letter to all the members in one industry in particular saying, look, fellas, you haven't done anything. The gloves are off. 
and we are prepared to be more proactive, and I'm discussing now the various strategies, which of course for obvious reasons I'm not in a position to get into any, any, any detail here. We are trying to be as innovative and as flexible and as everywhere at the same time as spreading ourselves as thinly as we can, but there's a great uh, uh, obligation on the part of an enforcement agency. If you get into this approach, you have to hammer the guys who are not complying. Uh, and we, we can't, you know, with the criminal law, we cannot give an un qualified, yes, we're going to do it because we have another partner in the, in the process. So that's the basic answer. But you're quite right. It's a mess. And, you know, I wish we had a better handle on it. Mr. Foss and I agree that we can all break for coffee now. I'd like you back if you could in 10 to 12 minutes. Thank you.